No. Whatever that term is. Thanks for joining us online today. Let's go.
These are your notices for June the 5th. Our church has been growing and so have our kids' ministries. We've decided to separate them out into three age groups. That's years one to three, four to six, and seven to eight. Years one to three will be in the Corfi room, which is go through the top right room. <laughs> years one to three will be in the top right room, which is the Corfi room. Their door is through the top right hand side at the front of the auditorium. The years four to six are in the Kakariki room, that's the middle room. And the years seven and eight are in the Fido room, which is in the back room through the sports cafe area. We're so excited to have Pastor Don and Julia McDonnell of Inspire Church Albany join us at the end of the month. They'll be here from the 24th to the 26th of June. Make sure you mark that date in your calendar and do not miss this weekend. Pastor Don will be speaking at youth 7pm on the Friday night. We'll have a men's brekkie Saturday morning and a women's morning tea also. Then we'll be having a leaders meeting Saturday night. He'll be speaking at our Sunday morning service and then we'll have an open service Sunday night for all of the churches of Hawke's Bay or anybody who wants to come and we encourage you to invite your friends along regardless of what church they go to. Pastor Don is an amazing evangelist with a prophetic gifting and we're so excited to see what he brings, up, brings for us. Right Church, I hope you have a really great week and a great Sunday. So, here's one to three, here's four to six, and our intermediates out in the fiddle room. I'm glad I'm not a parent because I'll probably forget that. The kids won't though, they'll know. Oh yeah, and the youth are down the front here. Hey! 
Lord, that you are who we say we are, not who we think we are, not who we see. You see the whole version of us, the free version of us. listening to this, um, I don't know, you know when you're scrolling, um, Brooke, Brooke Legit Wood, she was just talking about worship and she was talking about how there's scientific evidence that when we gather together in smaller groups and sing, that our hearts, our heart rates actually align. Huh. Isn't that neat? So we could say that this morning right now, we are one heart. (laughs) And when we sing, we give off this love hormone called oxytocin, which is the love, it's a safe hormone, it's a love hormone, it's a comfort hormone. Just by praising and worshiping our King and coming together as one. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, I thought it was anyway. It's amazing. I just think, I just think God just blows my pre brain just to add, just the way He works. Just like. And He created you and me in that image.
Is good. He's here today. He's living inside us. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Real good thing. It's good to see everyone here today. I um I just I was just uh, I I saw someone in the um in the foyer just before we started. Uh, there was a lady who was very very pregnant. Uh, I, I I don't know her name. I don't know if I've met her. If you're here, wave out. Oh, there you are. Uh, I do know you. It's, it's Emma. I didn't recognize you, Emma, but I felt like uh, I just kind of like saw, like when Pania was pregnant, can I get a bit more on this mic? Um, guys? Bruce? Uh, uh, when Pania was pregnant, I just, uh, she's beautiful, but I just always felt like that she was like even more beautiful when she was pregnant. Right, and I don't know how you fellas feel about that with, with your missuses, but um, but I just I just sort of caught a glimpse of your of your puku uh, as I was walking in here, and I just thought, man, this this is a time for you of new beginnings. Like this is a time for you of new birth, and it's not just a time of this baby, but it's significant for you and your family, Emma. And I just wanted to encourage you because I feel like there's something about this baby that is significant that is important. Even the baby itself is so called and so chosen. I just wanted to affirm that. And I feel like this, this is a season, this is, this, you're a sign of the time of our church right now, that we are, that we are pregnant, that we, are, we have a due date coming for us. We have a due date coming for us. That's for every single one of you. You have a due date coming for you. I just wanna say that. Because I feel like I feel like that when there's when there's tension in the room like there is now, this this I'm feeling waves of the Holy Spirit, and then I'm feeling waves of doubt 
and there's tension in the room, it means that God is, God is wanting to do something. He's wanting to break out and do something. And our doubt, our insecurity, even powers and principalities will stand against what God wants to do. And I say today, let God have His way. We say, let God have your way in our lives today. God, have your way in this church today. Lord, have your way in this area, in this region. Lord, this is a region that is plagued with spells. It's plagued with darkness. It's plagued with demonic activity for for years and years. And we say, be broken in Jesus' Name. You have planted us here as a light in the darkness, as a city on a hill that will not be hidden. And we declare it, come on, we declare it in Jesus' mighty Name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. So good. I'm gonna share a message with you this morning. My name's Kent. It's good to meet you. If you're new here, welcome, have a seat. Thank you, worship team. So good, love that last song, it's me. Had a primo message from uh, our founding pastor, Jack Lamborn. Can you remember what it was called? Whom? Whom? Can you remember? <laughs> Living for whom? Living for whom? Good message. Solid. Uh, I want to just make a shout out to, there's quite a, quite a few new people serving today. So it's like their day has come and they're like, some of you are on cameras, some of you are in creche, some of you are uh, like with the kids in, in the cafe or wherever you are. Hey, I just want to say like, awesome, like welcome and to, to serving and being part of a team. And it's a really great way to connect in a church today. Like back in the day, when we're back in the Baptist church, you know, the pastor would say, he'd be like, oh, okay, now just turn around and say hi to the person behind you, you know, and take one minute. You know, it's like one minute? Like you want me to get to know someone in one minute? You know, and it always went on a lot longer than uh, what the pastor wanted to, yeah, than one minute, than what the pastor wanted to have happen. And so getting to know each other is great in the context of a team. You know, I actually had someone said to me, like, you don't get to know anyone in this church unless you're part of a team. I'm like, woohoo. <laughs> you know, I thought that was really good. Actually, a good thing. I thought it was a good thing. And also, it's Pentecost Sunday today. Like, I didn't know, I had to be reminded about that. Thanks, Sarah, wherever you are. It's Pentecost Sunday. So it's when we kind of like commemorate and celebrate the Holy Spirit, in like in Acts, the book of Acts, you know the book of Acts? And like the Holy Spirit came and she said, hey, wait, wait there till he comes and he'll empower you, yes. right? And so there was manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Some people say, well, that was for then. Um, I can't live my life without the Holy Spirit, so I say it's for now too. <laughs> Just my experience. You can figure out what you believe. I'll never forget, actually, we did our pastor's training and uh, one of our teachers was a guy called uh, Jim Shaw. And Jim's an amazing uh, teacher of, of the Word. And uh, we, had a, like a, we had lots of like, questions for him. But one of the things that he would do on a hard question, and I knew he knew the answer, or so to speak, is he would say, well, what do you believe? What do you think? He goes, no, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what you think. Or, or, Pastor Jim, what's your interpretation of the Scripture? Well, what do you think it is? It doesn't matter what I think. What do you think it is? Uh, and so it really kind of like made us really kind of dig down and dig a little deeper. Yeah, we were challenged. Thanks, Ross. We were challenged by that. And so I guess I want to challenge you today about what do you, what you believe. What do you think the Bible says about that funny X that they use in maths to say this is an unknown, <laughs> that thing. What do you think the Bible says about that? What do you believe it says about issues of today? Because what I've noticed is that today in the world, there are things 
that you are not allowed to have an opinion about and you are not allowed to talk about and certainly do not give the Bible its interpretation of what this says about a subject. And hell no. Can I say hell no? So hell's in the Bible, kind of. Uh, can, we, can we, like, don't talk about it at church. Like, that's off limits. You know, there's like touchy subjects that a pastor should never talk about. You know, we used to think money was the tough one. It ain't. It's not anymore. But I think maybe the, the week before when I spoke about identity, I kind of feel sorry because I should have kind of, I kind of should have like prepared you guys better for that. I should have said, you know, we're going to talk a little bit out about identity and, you know, you might, you know, might challenge you within who you are. Because it's all good to like speak about everybody else, you know. You can go back and watch the replay of me making my mistakes. And be like, ah, shame on that guy, you know. Like, but you ain't up here speaking, so. Well, I just lost my train of thought. It's all good. It'll come back. It's just coming around. We just went through a tunnel and we lost signal. Yeah, so those touchy subjects that you shouldn't talk about. <clears throat> and what I wanna kind of like challenge you about is, is to kind of dig down and go, well, what does God say on that topic? If I'm a Christian, then, then what do I believe about that? And I feel like that there's this tension between, you know, okay, I'm just gonna lay this out there even though it's, I'm kind of way off track, but... I just wanna lay this out because there's this kind of tension between, uh, in the church between, hey, you just come as you are, like it's all good, you know? We have the sign out the front, everybody is welcome. You know? You know the sign? The website. It's on the newsletter. A church for everyone. <laughs> That's so nice. But if you've been around church long enough, you will know your experiences that is not the case. It's a church for everyone. Just as long as, you know, as long as you fit into this thing. It's a church for everyone as long as I can point out your faults. It's a church for everyone just as long as I can judge you, you know. It's a church for everyone as long as I can be the Holy Spirit and I can like interfere with your business. Okay, it's real quiet in here. <laughs> That's my experience. That's my experience when I've taken people who don't know God to church. And it shouldn't be so. Okay, part two is that there is a level for leadership. So when you wanna be a leader in the church, that's when you cannot come as you are. When you're a leader in the church, then Paul's very clear the, that a leader should look like this. Da, 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 da. But what we do is we take Paul's leadership uh, credentials, qualifications, what, how, what we should be like, and then we put them onto the new believer going, you're welcome just as long as you add up to what Paul says you should be like. But it's up for... God to lead and guide and us to like, I don't know, uffy, what's the word? Like, like get alongside, like help people who are new to church, not giving them like the hard list of things that you can and cannot do. You've got to let God be patient. Let God reveal to them what's going on. You know what I'm saying? Can we, can we like get, can we, can we, can we get that? Because there's people who want to come to church and it is scary. The, the, the courage and the boldness that it takes, the, the desperation that I'm in right now to be able to walk through those doors Un, into the unknown. Who am I gonna 
me? Who is going to be there for me? How will I be received? You will be amazed who will be in heaven with you. You know all those other churches out there that you don't like? Well, most of them will be there as well. So you might as well get on well with them now, you know? Oh, that's another thing, but who, who will be there? You know, you can, if you want a mission, if you want a mission, come to church and wait in the foyer. If you want ministry, come to church and wait out there in the foyer and wait for the new person to come in. Just look at them. Wait for them. Are they new? Oh, they're new. Like, and meet them. And shake their hand and smile. Get them a coffee. Find them a seat. Sit with them. Ask them lots of questions. Be a friend. That's the greatest ministry I think you can do. And so, yeah, so good. Anyway, let's get to the message. That's kind of an introduction. It's kind of an introduction. Over the last two years, over the last two years, what's happened in our world has caused major division. It's, it's like, it's polarized people. It's polarized friendships and families. Like it's brought out the worst in us. It's also brought out the best in us. It's also slowed some things down, real slow. It's also sped a whole lot of things up. I'll give you a little, a little quote from, from a guy who's written a book about it, a guy called um, Scott Galloway, and he says, take any trend, social, business, or personal, and fast forward 10 years. The pandemic was an accelerant. No wonder we are exhausted. Another, um, another quote from uh, Andy Stanley, he says, difference is inevitable, but division is a choice. So, you would, you, you, I mean, you don't have to think about it, and I can uh, sometimes like just hearing about the words pandemic and COVID, like I just, I just don't even want to hear that anymore. You know, like I'm reaching for the off button on my radio. You know, anybody else here like that? You know, you're, you know, you're like you know, like I'm pre, I am preaching to the converted right now about this. Like you know how bad, it, how, how annoying it is, how bad it is, how frustrating it is. How scary it can be. How annoying about how other people are so scared about how scary it has been. So you know about that polarization. You know that even like in churches, people have left our church because we're not safe enough. Other people have joined our church because we're not, we're not safe enough. Yeah. <clears throat> um, do you know what I mean? And I don't think that's, a, that's not a good enough reason to leave a church. Having separate services for uncircumcised and circumcised? I mean, vaccinated and unvaccinated? <laughs> uh, well, what's up with that? I mean, Paul talks about there should be no division among you. See, because you can't talk about this while you're going through it. We're going to do it post-mortem, you know? <clears throat> so I want to talk to you about this idea, right? Because this message is called Standing in the Middle. Standing in the Middle. Because people don't meet when they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. They meet in the middle. You don't resolve things in your marriage when you stay at opposite ends of the argument, you meet in the middle. And so this idea of being in the middle is not talking about compromise. It's not talking about compromising on, your, on your, who you are or your, or your morals or what the Word of God says, not at all. But there is like what Andy Stanley said, there's the difference is inevitable, 
inevitable, but division is a choice. It's our choice whether we wanna be divided. It's our choice whether we wanna cause contention. It's our choice. I mean, I'm talking not just in the church, I'm talking about in your workplace, like in your schools, with your relationships, even in your family. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but we had some like weird conversations with my family, you know, like about, hey dad, I see you down the back there, it's all good, <laughs> got you. Um, that is my dad down there too, by the way. Shout out to you, dad. He's a good preacher too. Yeah, you know, I asked him to preach here once and he said no. <laughs> so thanks, yeah. But a good question is, is how people, what do people um, feel when they are around you, you know? Do they feel like part of the team? Do they feel uh, as equals? Or do they feel unequal? Do they feel kind of like pushed out a little bit? How do you make the environment around you and people around you feel? Are you, re are you prepared to listen and hear what, you know, where people are at? So, you know, people are not always wanting to force their opinions on you, but oftentimes, excuse me, they're sharing about what's going on in their lives and how they feel. Are we prepared to listen to, to that? Modern day evangelism is about communication. It's about hearing somebody, understanding them, and then sharing God's word with them. Often we wanna do it around the other way. Often we don't even know what God's word is. Often we're too busy talking to, listening to the talk back about you know, how things should be. Well, God's word is about how things should be, but we need to dive into that and get that in us. And I'm not talking just about me from the pulpit, I'm talking about you at home with your Bible in your quiet time on a daily basis. That's my expectation for you. Martin Luther King, he said, this is a letter from Birmingham jail, okay? Martin Luther King Jr. He says, I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. He goes on to say, I have tried to stand between these two forces saying that we need to emulate neither the do-nothingism or the complacent, of the complacent, nor the hatred and despair of the black nationalists. Basically saying there's two, there's two, two sides here. There's the fellows that wanna go out for blood and there's the guys who are like doing nothing. And he, okay, and so for there is a more excellent way of love and non-violent protest. I am grateful to God that through the influence of the Negro church, it says Negro in here too, by the way, the, the way of non-violence became an integral part of our struggle. If this philosophy had not emerged by now, many streets of the South would I am convinced, be flowing with blood. I stand between two forces. I stand in the middle. <clears throat> Which kind of like leads me to a good scripture, right? In Ezekiel. It says, come up on the screen, 22, 30. I looked for someone among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land so I would not have to destroy it or on behalf of the people, but I found no one. So I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their own heads all they have done declares the sovereign Lord. Okay, this is a, a difficult time for, um, for the Israelites, for this people. Uh, the gap here represents the danger facing Jerusalem. God's wrath is about to break through in judgment on the sinful city. Was there no one who would in righteousness intercede on behalf of the city and seek God's mercy? God searched for such a defender. God searched for such a defender, but he could find none. It seems that if someone had been willing to stand in the gap, the destruction of Jerusalem could have been avoided. Since no one was available or willing to, willing to defend the breach and rebuild the wall, judgment fell. And there's a whole, like, there's, you can read, if you read the, the chapter, Ezekiel 22, you'll get the context of why judgment was falling. 
you'll get all the bad stuff, basically. And the doomsday prophet is thwarted. Is that a word I can use? Stopped? Because of you and me. Because I know that you are willing to stand in the gap. I know that you pray for the city. I know that you pray for New Zealand. Well, we do it. It means prayer meeting on Tuesday mornings at 6.30. Maybe it's just us. Hey, Gavin's there, Jack. Oh, this Thursday night as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, well, yeah, the big dogs are on uh, Tuesday. <laughs> Jay's there, you know. Um, Zach, uh, Zahn, is, Zahn is there most, most times. The man. And uh, yeah, but, you know, because I, like, I, hear, I hear like some like doomsday stuff, you know, thus said the Lord, he will rain down fire upon thee. And those transgressions uh, will be made known unto thee. Uh, you know, if you want to preach, just put a ah uh, on the end of everything. Yeah, uh. all right. Uh. <laughs> but I think that it's not happening because of the church, because of our prayers. Anyway. Do you want another example? Okay, cool. Abraham. Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 18. The men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, <clears throat> will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous as the wicked alike. For far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? This is Abraham <laughs> talking to God. This is Abraham talking to God. He's like, Bro, far be it from you. Like, what the heck are you doing? You can't do this, God. Uh, when was the last time you, you had a conversation with God like that? Maybe, I don't know. Standing in the middle. So the middle is the bridge that brings the two sides together, right? I left my Lego at home. It's okay. Okay, another, another example. 1 Corinthians 3, 1, 9. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you're not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. What's he talking about? He's talking about you guys being immature. Or not you guys, but you know, those, those guys. Let's say those guys. Okay, St stay with me. Stay, stay with me. Those guys. We're reading the Bible, guys, you know? Like, be excited. How many people bought their Bible today? Oh, oh. Like, that's good. Whew. Can you, can you hold that up and I'll just get a photo to show my pastor friends? I'm like, bro, look at, look at, look at my church, cuz. Like, they got all their Bibles out. Like, so good. Feel free to take notes and uh, read your Bible in church. It's okay. Uh, you are still worldly. For, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Polarization. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, I follow Jack. Oh, no, no, no. I follow Ken. Eh? No, no one does it like Jack does it. Yeah, but, I, but Ken's the new guy on the block, you know. He's got those mean-ass jeans, you know. 
Yeah, and he's cool. You know, remember, because we talked about the criteria for a pastor must be to be cool. I hadn't seen that in the Bible. What, after all, is Jack? What, after all, is Kent? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Jack watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God. What's Paul doing? He's standing in the middle. He's saying, this polarization, guys, is not right. You're bickering about things that don't matter. It's God that gives the increase. It's God that we wanna attract. It's God that's gonna do something amazing. You're just the old fickle old vessel, the old stinky old jars of clay that are gonna like conduit that. So don't think more highly than you should. In actual fact, your jealousy, like your bickering is immature. So stop it. That's what he's, that, that's what he's saying. <laughs> so neither, verse seven, did I read that? So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field and God's building. One more. Everybody say one more. This is my favorite one. John 8, 3 to 11. As he was speaking, this is Jesus, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Okay, she's been caught in the act. So she's probably um, been kind of like manhandled by them. Probably her clothes were torn. She probably hasn't got much on. There's a whole bunch of people looking at her and the religious leaders, the people of the church that day, have dragged her into a public arena for her to be judged, thrown her down in the dust in front of Jesus, right? Just wanted to paint the picture a little bit there for you. <clears throat> Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Not the uh, actions I was expecting him to take. Who are you? Like, who does that? They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, all right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, only until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn, condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. What's he doing? He's standing in the middle. So there's a couple of things at play. One is that the Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus because if you were caught in adultery, both parties should be there to be stoned. But there was only her. Did Jesus save her life? Probably. Most probably. Did Jesus condemn her? No. What did Jesus write in the dust? That's a question. Was he 
noughts and crosses, Sudoku. I said, well, what was it? Like, he drew a line in the sand. Yes, he did. <laughs> he drew a line in the sand. He drew a few. Some, some people say, like, he may have even started writing the sins of the accusers in the dirt. And then when the, of course, if you're in, it says the oldest went first, going, oh, yeah, got me. <laughs> and the young fellows who, like, you know, think that they're all that, they take a little while longer, you know. You need more detail. No, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. Oh, yeah, no, you got me, yeah. <laughs> Jesus standing in the middle. Where, where do you stand? Where are you gonna stand tomorrow on Monday? So if I can bring that into today, because it's just, what, how are we going for time? I can't tell. Uh, we, um, if we can bring that in today, what I like about what Jesus says, is he says, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more, right? Jesus has a way that he wants that woman to live. But it's not at the cost of condemning her or taking her life, right? God has a way that he wants you to live, but he's not condemning you in that. And the same message that he said to the woman is the same message that he says to us today. I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. And so there's this, yeah, this, this idea of, uh, Uh, I mean, our, th there are some laws that are, that are around identity at the moment that the government has made that basically say that if you say you're something, then no one has the right to change you or to help you change, right? Uh, so on Family First, you can look at it. But so like I really disagree with that because it's God's word that changes us. Everyone, everyone is entitled to change, Everyone has the opportunity to change. In actual fact, the point of discipleship is to become Christ-like. In actual fact, if you really dive into discipleship, the word would mean understudy, right? And an understudy learns the part of the, of the main role in a play, in an act, in a drama, right? So if you're gonna learn Jesus' part, then you'll be his understudy, okay, right? And then when does the understudy come in? When the main part cannot be there, the main actor, right? Are you with me? Just nod your head. Yeah, or say yep, yeah. So Jesus is gone now, right? He's, he's not here, so he needs his understudy to carry on the act, so to speak. Okay. That's you. Like, grab the person next to you and say, that's you, bro. That's you. Well, I'll get the team back up. I just want to finish with one more, like, idea, one more, one more scripture. It's like one that, we, that is very famous that we all know. It says, it's in Romans 2, 12, 2. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Good, it's good. And so can I give you some strongs for a minute? Can I give you some Greek yeah, is that okay? So the transform word is actually metaf metamorphosis or the, from the Greek word where we get metamorphosis from, right? And that means change after being with. Change after being with. Changing, in 
changing form in keeping with inner reality, properly transformed after being with. So you cannot be with God and not be changed. You cannot be with God and have the very fabric of your identity of who you are changed. I am who you say I am. I'm chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. I feel like someone's getting, getting it. Like, I feel like I might be speaking to one person, maybe. You are, you, you are changeable. You are changeable. I think that sometimes in our lives, we get to a point where we, we ask ourselves and we say, can I, can I even change? If I'm broken, can I even be healed? And the answer is yes, you can. And the other word, word in there is, is conform, which means identified with. What have you conformed to? What have you identified with that needs to be transformed? And the ultimate example of standing in the middle would be the cross, would be Jesus. Why don't, you, why don't you stand up? We're gonna finish. We'll close off. You know, because we've been, we were polarized by sin, separated from God, the Bible says. And we needed someone to stand in the middle. We needed a saviour. And that Saviour is Jesus Christ. And I always wanna give an opportunity for you to know Him. That's the best thing that you can do. That's the greatest thing that you can do in your life is to give your heart to Him, is to invite Him into your life, is to let Him be the bridge, let Him be the, the middle that you can come to. It says when we come to, to God, when we come to Jesus, sorry, then we can come boldly before God our maker, our creator, the one who gives us our identity, the ones who shows us who we really are. It's important, man. This, this is actually really, really important because you live your life out of who you are. You make decisions day after day out of who you are. You imprint the same pattern onto your children if you don't know who you are, who you are, they'll struggle to know who they are. Like this is this is really really important. And my ex my experience is that I struggled with who I was. And the more and more I looked into God's word, more the more and more I looked into His Bible, the more and more I had a relationship with Jesus, the more and more I realized that man, I. I I'm a, I'm a different person. Like God calls me to be someone different. You know, you think about Gideon. I'm the least of the least. And he says, no man, you're strong. You're courageous. Like rise up mighty warrior. Rise up mighty man of valor. Rise up people of God. Rise up church. So I just wanna lead you in a prayer this morning to invite Jesus into your heart. Today, people online, whenever you're watching, so just take a minute right now to just pray before God. I'll lead you in a prayer right now. Just close your eyes if you want to. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I come before you today. Thank you for the price you paid for me by dying on the cross. I believe in my heart that you were Lord that you died and rose again. Forgive me of my sin. Thank you, I'm made right with you today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So good.
these guys are gonna sing. If you want some prayer this morning, if there's something in here in this message that stirred your heart, then I'd love to pray for you. We've got a prayer team here. If you've made a decision to follow Jesus today, then I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to meet you as well up the, up the front here as well. As well as that, you can talk to the ladies at the hay table. Hey, down there, give us a wave. Give them a wave, guys. Like, you're like, well, there they are. Yeah, so good. All right, let's sing. We lift up our voices and we will declare the sovereign, your beauty. We know that you care. The sweet name of Jesus, the lifter of my head. Father, I love you. You take me as I am. And all of our weakness and all of my runs through me and I will never be the same cause I
的。